Well, thank you for, um, for letting us come. A special thanks to Fred for inviting us back. Very rarely do I get invited back, and so that's just been really amazing. Uh, and I just hope that you got, um, you know, I hope that you got a tithe back on what I got for being here. And uh, by that, I mean, if you just got 10% of what I received from being here, then I think you'll be well satisfied as you go home, because we've had an amazing time, as we've talked about already. Um, my family's had a great time. Uh, we had an amazing time in uh, Yellowstone, in the Grand Tetons, and, and then to be with you guys here for the last couple of days. Thank you for letting me be who I am. Uh, that's all I can be. And uh, by the way, that's all you can be for very long. And um, if you end up trying to hide who you are and try to be somebody else, you're not going to last real long uh, because they'll find that out. And so, again, thank you for letting me be here. And I kind of want to wrap up um, just a little bit of a review and then try to give us some charging, marching orders as we head back to the real world. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if this was the real world? Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, and uh, somebody's got our kids over there. We see them at dinner, lunchtime and dinner and then put in the bed and we wake back up and then come to our rooms. Our rooms are clean and then somebody uh, would just be amazing. And so uh, that would be awesome. But that's not what we're called to do. But we are called to get away and be here every once in a while and do that. So what I've tried to talk about uh, over the last couple of days is the fact that you and I are called to be jugglers. And so next time somebody asks you, hey, what do you do for a living? Instead of saying pastor and killing that conversation, you can say, hey, I'm a juggler, because that'll open up a conversation. And you can talk about, hey, I juggle all kinds of things. I juggle this next world that we're going to, that we're going to spend more time there than this world we live in right now. But we're living here now, so I juggle that. <coughs> I juggle people. I juggle their problems. I juggle their challenges. I juggle trying to point them to this Jesus person that I think is real and change my life. And while I'm trying to lead other people to him, I'm trying to lead myself toward him. And that's a challenge because I've got this sinful nature that I have to battle against. And I've got all these other things that I have to to juggle. And and maybe that'll start a conversation. Maybe that'll make them look at you weird and walk away. I don't know. Um, But to me, it sounds more cool than saying pastor. And so that's what I'm going to start trying on that. But I've tried to say that (coughs) we've got these, at least these six balls that we have to juggle all the time. And they're not in conflict. And a lot of things that we think are conflict that we try to solve are not a conflict. It's just something we have to manage. It's going to be there. We can't fix it. We're going to to recognize that. You're never going to solve all your problems. Just don't lose your heart for Jesus when you're following in that. So is there anybody that would say, hey, you know what? I'm I'm really struggling in that family and friends area in life. Anybody would say, have a tough time with friends and family? You can't. You have to put your hand down. You guys back over here because I don't want to take this home with me. So I want you to take that home with you guys. And put that someplace, it has a little too much air in it, but do you ever want to reduce that air? The guy that put it in there was not very good at it. But you can take that and have that and put that someplace to remind you that, hey, family and friends, that is a a ball that I've got to juggle. It's not the only one, but I've got to do that, and it matches your shirt too as well. So that's awesome. How many of you have a job that is outside of your church job that you have to struggle with? You, all right, you're wearing blue. This is going to be so nice. I'm going to send it to the blue. Both of you are in blue. This marriage conference has worked for you guys. Here you go. So you can take that, and remember, that's one of the balls I've got to juggle, but it's not the most important one. I've got to do it, and that gives me opportunity to tell people about Jesus and something that I don't normally do. They don't know necessarily that I follow Jesus, and so that might be a good thing. How about your church job? This is the one that's really overinflated. And so anybody wearing yellow that's overinflated that wants to take the yellow ball home with? <laughs> okay, I didn't think so, but I'll just roll this down the aisle, and whoever wants to grab the uh, church job, and looks like it goes to you. All right, there we go. Hey, yeah, well, that ball doesn't roll straight, and so that's the problem. I think it's mountainous here, too, so it's all kind of floating on the other. But the church job is important. It's one of the balls you've got to juggle. There's a lot riding on you, but it's not your calling. You may, you may go to another church. Somebody else can pass that church. Somebody else can run that ministry. It is something you have to do, but it's not the only thing you have to do. How many of you have made some significant progress uh, the last couple of days with spouse? Anybody would say you made some progress? You guys over here? Really? All right. You're not wearing red, but I'll bounce it to you anyway. Uh, so you take that one. And remember that even though we go to heaven alone, because we just stand there not with our spouse, so you better have the right directions at that point if you're not a direction person in your family. But you're going to stand before God by yourself, but until we get there, he's given us somebody to walk that journey with us, and that's that spouse that we had better finish well with, and we had better be the one there in that nursing home together uh, when it all finishes up in this life. But at the same time, we've got to care about ourselves. How many of you have done a better job or are going to have to make, do a better job for self because of this conference? All right, he's wearing purple. Here we go, back to our theme. That's very good. <laughs> Appreciate that. People are throwing shoes at me now. What is this shoe? What is going on over here? What is going on with the lions? What is going on with the lion otters? 
Okay, all right, very good. That's, that doesn't surprise me on that. And so it is, it is self. You've got to take care of yourself. Nobody else in your church is thinking about you. They're just not. They're not worried about you until Sunday morning or until they need you. Otherwise, they don't think about you. So you're doing all this stuff for people that don't even care, don't even think about it, and you're burning yourself out instead of following Jesus. And somebody here, hopefully, around this past week, you've already got blue. You've already got one per family. I'm so sorry. I know. I'm sorry. Well, then make him give the blue one back, and you can have the God ball. How do you want to do that? Okay. We'll just wait till they have this conversation. So it's fine. We'll just take our time over here. That's okay. Do, do, do. I have to play music. But this is the ball that we cannot drop because this is the one that we go to. All the other things, listen to me, scary. All the other things are going to fade. You're not going to have your spouse in the way that we have them now. You're not going to have the family and friends. It's just going to be you and God. And so this is one we cannot lose. Lose your church before you lose this one. Lose your friends before you lose this one. Because this is what finally gets you there. Who wants the orange ball besides you? You back over here. All right, William, see if I can roll it down the aisle. Very good. A kickball. Here we go. Your turn. All right, so very good. <laughs> also in the back, I've got uh, some of the juggling balls, I think, are still back there in that box. Uh, and if you haven't grabbed one, you've got some kids, you want one, take them home, please. I don't want to take any of this stuff home with me, so feel free to take those things. But today, in this final session, I want to talk about something that we talk about, but we don't really do a lot about sometimes, because... There's this weird thing that happens to us uh, as men and as pastors for most of us, and that is this idea of competition with one another. And, and I hate this, I hate this, I hate this, I hate this, but oftentimes we meet one another in a conference, well, how's your church going? And we immediately talk about numbers. Well, we had 7,000 in Sunday school last week, right? You know. Or we baptized 50, or we baptized four, or we baptized this, or all these things. And somehow we end up competing against one another. We had a guy in our area named Paul. And Paul's a great guy, he loves Jesus, all that kind of stuff. But I don't, I'm not normally competitive unless you compete against me. Okay? If you go first, I will definitely join you in your competition. Especially if I can beat you, I will join you, right? If I can't beat you, I may not join you as quickly. <coughs> but we, we had this guy who lived in a different town. We had, we had two different towns that all feeds the same school district. You have one of those situations, everybody goes to the same school, but there's another. And so it sure felt like he wanted to be the pastor of First Baptist Branson because all of his events that he, were, he would do were not in his town, which is another town. All of his events would be in Branson, which is about 20 minutes away. Jeannie's back there going, I know who this is. Joey left, fortunately. He's counseling with somebody. But it drove me crazy. Because I'm like, there's plenty of lost people over there. Don't come bother my lost people, all right? I'm not reaching them, so you shouldn't either, right? <laughs> Just the, kind of the way that we feel about things, right? These are my lost people I'm not doing anything with, not yours. And he would come back, and he'd be do the big Easter celebration, and, and he would take one of the Branson theaters, and he would... And it packed, you know, there's 2,500 people at the room seats, and he'd run 700 in there. And we'd run 2,000 on a Sunday morning on our Easter Sundays. And I'd look at you and go, what are you doing? What are you thinking? And he just wanted to compete. And so I would compete against him. And it's the stupidest thing we could possibly do. But I would do it. And I know that doesn't happen in Montana. I know you guys don't compete against each other. First off, you're not in the same market, the same region. You're so far from one another, it doesn't really matter what's going on in that. Until somebody moves in pretty close. You're like five counties over. And then you get a little concerned. <laughs> hey, they're planning a church two and a half hours away from me, and they may take my four people and go over there with those. And so I'm upset now <laughs> on this. So what I want to talk about is, is this concept of being united. And being united is so difficult, especially with each other, which it shouldn't be. But this is kind of like working together for the kingdom cause, and maybe it's better here, but where I'm from, when there's so many churches, so many people, so many competitions, and people go from church to church, <coughs> it is just a challenge for me. And so I want to leave us on this thought of being united. I don't know what you think of when you think of the word united. It's kind of a happy word. It's kind of a word that we don't really use a whole lot, 
But when I think of United as the word, you know what I think of? I think of the airlines, United Airlines. Now, partially because I'm going to be flying them later this afternoon. So that's probably the reason I'm thinking of them. And of course, this is their old logo, because when they got together, they went together with Continental. And so they borrowed Continental's logo and kept their own name. And so now United Airlines look like this. But when you think of the word United, for many of us, the thought goes to an airline. In fact, Kendra uh, flew to some place in the middle of Idaho last year. She happens to teach at a classical Christian school now, uh, which is a radically different environment in some ways. And you had a conference in some place where it was at Idaho, in near Boise, Idaho. And you guys got stuck because United did not provide the flights for you. And so anytime I say United, she kind of gets this little twitch when you say United, because it was one of those spend the night together in the airport nights. Ever had one of those? Those are lots of fun, aren't they? And so she has one of that. So when I set United to her, that's not really the feeling that she has, a positive of United of this. But there's other words. What else do you think of when you think of United? United what? United States? What else? Together. Together. What about the United Nations, which are neither one of those things, states being together? (laughs) They're supposed to be. Ideally, they're supposed to be. But we have this concept of being united as nations, and it doesn't work, right? There's just too many things going on there. I don't know if you have this group of people in your state or not, but we have the United Methodist Church in our area of Missouri, and it's always interested, the United Methodist Church. Quite an interesting concept. Uh, And maybe they are more united than Baptist with this. But when I think of United, I think of these guys, because this is Manchester United. Now, I'm a soccer guy, so let me just kind of apologize for that and then keep moving forward, all right? The word united in soccer is a very powerful word. There's Newcastle United, there's Manchester United, there's all these teams that put United in their name. We don't do that as American football. We don't have Seattle Seahawks United. We don't have that, right? We don't don't have Arkansas Razorbacks United. We don't have United in that. But in soccer, that idea of unity is really important. In fact, Manchester United is the third most valuable sports franchise in the world. They are worth an estimated $3.1, $3.2 billion with a B. I think the Yankees are like fifth or fourth. The Dallas Cowboys are in the top ten. But the top three are soccer teams in the world of value. Barcelona, Real Madrid, and then finally Manchester United. Manchester United started in 1904 with the carriage and wagon division of the Yorkshire Railroad. And it was just a bunch of guys getting together, playing soccer, football. And the problem was that they kept running out of money and the company didn't want to support them. And so there were three business guys who got together and bought the franchise for $400, 400 pounds a piece back in 1904. Now think about that. For a 1,200 pound investment, let's just say $2,400 investment in 1904, has mushroomed, has blossomed to today three point. One three point two billion dollars. Now that's a great investment, if you can live to be one hundred and twenty. Right? That'd be really really nice because it's nineteen oh four, and at that time it'd be really nice. But this concept of being united is something that is so powerful in soccer. It's all these teams called United because they brought together three different people, three different investors, and they said, if we're going to do this, we're going to do this together. And over the years, over the generations. They're still a united group. And it made incredible investment, credible invent, advancement. If you know anything about soccer, these guys win almost every year, at least in the past. last couple of years have been a little tough. But more than likely, this is the, one of the most valuable franchises. It is in the English Premier League. It is in Britain. Third in the entire world, more valuable than anything else. When I think about united, what I want to think about when I leave, though, is this. What would happen in the state of Montana if that became the new symbol for unity. I know it almost sounds strange, doesn't it? United Baptists. You just don't, that's just, Baptist United. That just doesn't seem to, to go to, it sounds kind of nice. And, and you know, every once in a while you'll see a church that's Unity Baptist Church. And you know they were a split from someplace else. You know that, right? I mean, that's the reason they put unity in their name. We have a church in our community called Friendly, Friendly Baptist Church. And you're like, okay, well, we know what that happened. And, 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 and recently we got a call 
because um, they got First Baptist Church and Friendly Baptist Church confused, and, and our, one of our worship guys ended up having to yell at the guy to convince him we were not the church, and he hung up, and I'm like, well, I think you pretty much convinced him that we're not the Friendly Baptist Church, because you just, <laughs> you just yelled at him pretty loud about that, and so I think that's covered. But what, uh, what instead of people thinking of Baptist as confused, as fighting, as angry, as disagreeing about things and competition with one another, what if they thought about us as being united together? Because you really, you, you're desperately in need of being united in Montana. You are. And you know that better than I do, and I don't even know what I'm talking about at this point, but you know how important that is. And so my hope, Fred's hope, is that when you come to something like this, you'll be reconnected to know that you don't have to be alone out there. You can choose to be, and that's why most of the people are in Montana, right? Because they want to be away from everybody else. Why else would you come here, right? But there's a lot of people who recognize over time, maybe they do, maybe they don't, that our separation from one another may be easier for us to manage, but is the death of us to be in separation and isolation. So my hope is that we will walk away from here going, you know what, we're not in competition, and I'm so glad that their church is doing well. And I'm glad that your church is expanding, and I'm glad that that's happening. Sometimes we have this newspaper in our state, the state convention paper, and it seems like all it is is propaganda about how great somebody else is doing in ministry. And I read it page after page, and their ministry is successful, and, and they're taking mission trips, and look at the people that were in revival, and look at the baptism that are happening. And sometimes I don't even read the newspaper because I get frustrated because I'm not seeing that in my other church, and for some reason they think that motivates me, and for some reason, if I'm not careful, it demotivates me to the ministry. Because I look at mine and go, well, mine's not. Theirs is something wrong with somebody in this. And sometimes I point, it's other people that the problem is, it's the deacons, it's the people that come to this church, and then sometimes the only thing that I've been able to recognize in my life is that every time that I've had a problem, I'm the only one who is always there. Every time I have a problem. It's kind of strange. So then I begin to look at me and go, oh, it must be me, oh, it must be me. But we're not here to build our own little franchise. We're not here to build our own little church. We're not here to be. We're part of something so much larger than that, and we're handed a piece of that. We're part of this larger mosaic. And you know what a mosaic is? It's a bunch of broken pieces that somebody puts together and makes pretty. That's what it is. And we've just got a little piece of this mosaic. We're not the whole picture. And if we take our little broken piece and try to put a whole picture on there, you've seen those pictures, haven't you, where they take that little tiny picture of one thing and they mix it in something that's larger and when you step back from that larger picture, it makes something. Have you seen those things? I don't even know what they call them. But in a way, that's kind of what we're supposed to be doing. But our concentration is not the little picture. Our concentration is the bigger picture. So we should be cheering for one another. Instead of a competition, we should be this fraternity of pastors, these fraternity of churches. And I know that you have this. I know that you have this. But I want to challenge you to take that from a small U united to a capital U united. Have you ever noticed this? In the Declaration of Independence, which you probably have memorized, it says, in Congress on July 4, 1776, the unanimous declaration of the... Have you ever noticed that? What's capitalized in that? States of America. Now, the word united is there, but it's lowercase. Maybe it's because the cheer, S-A, 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 just doesn't sound very cool. And maybe they need to come back and add USA, USA, USA. But the United in States of America was not a part of their understanding, at least originally, as the phraseology of who we are as a country. But something happened that united us where we elevated not just the states of America to become the United States of America. And it fundamentally changed who we were. Now, was that the war that we fought? Was that all the things? I don't know how all that works. I'm not necessarily a historian. But I find it fascinating that when you look at that, it is the 13 united states of America. But somewhere along the way in our country, we became the united states of America. I think challenging right now, we're back to the states of America. And that we may not be able to survive with that as our motif. And there's all kinds of things that happen in the convention. Maybe you know about them. Maybe you don't know about them. I hope you don't know about most of them. I can remember a state convention that we're still suing each other and our entities broke away and they left and we're suing each other. And we've been in lawsuits for the last 10 or 12 years against each other over hundreds of millions of dollars. I happen to serve as the president of the Missouri Baptist Convention right now, so I'm smack dab in the middle of it. 
It's a lot of fun, too. Anybody believe that? I hope you don't. So what would it take for us to be united? Well, I think it's going to take us to be capital united to go back to the scriptures and actually read it because it is fundamental because we're not going to be able to do this by ourselves. We have to do this together. So the Bible teaches this. Paul, in the book of Philippians, writing back to his friends, a group of people, a a church, really, and he says them these words that I think if we can take these words and remember them, then maybe we can go from a lowercase u united to a capital U united. He says, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, he's building his case, he's laying out why. He's telling us why we've got to be united. If there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by, and I'm going to have to go back through this again, so this, just hang on with me, being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. That's how we do it. So let me go back and break all that down for you. I didn't build this the way that I wanted to, so excuse me as I have to click back. But this says, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, those of you who are Greek scholars know this is first class conditional in the Greek. And so it is not just a maybe, it is a well, duh. It is not a since, it is a because. And so what he's arguing is not this idea that, well, are these true or are these not true? He's arguing that since these are true, it's more of a sense than an if or maybe. And notice what he argues that are true, that if you've had ever any encouragement in Christ, any encur- have you ever been encouraged by Christ? Well, I hope all of us in this room would go, yes, we have been encouraged in Christ. And I hope we go not just once, but multiple times. In fact, I hope you're sitting there going, well, you're such a dummy because that's the only way I survive is that I get my encouragement in Christ. Well, Paul says, if you've ever felt that, then you must be united. Now, if you haven't felt that, then it's optional. You don't have to be united if you don't want to. But because you have had the encouragement of Christ, if you've ever received any comfort from love, by the way, that word encouragement If I remember correctly, yes, that word encouragement is that parakletos word. It's that calling alongside. It's the word that's oftentimes used the Holy Spirit. It's one who's called alongside to be of support and to be of help. So if you ever had the spirit of Christ come beside you and encourage you, then you must be united. This word for comfort is even more than that. It's it's a word that, that means coming alongside really close. As you've probably heard a little bit already, I have a a large personal space. I really do. I do. I do. And some people don't. And so sometimes people encroach. How many of you have a large personal space? Okay. And how many of you have no idea what I'm talking about at this point? Okay. Thank you very much. All right. So some of you have no idea because you will come up to me and you will come up and you will talk to me like this right here. Okay. And I'm always constantly backing up because I have a large personal space and you just don't know what's going on. So you continue to follow me in that space. Right. (laughs) And so I had to finally end up going to the wall and going, hey, put your hand out, stop, right? Because I don't want anything close. Well, this second word is if you've had any comfort, it's the parakletos close is what it really means. It's not the Greek word there, but it's what it means. It means that this person's really, really close to you. They want to be close. And so it's not just an encouragement that's coming alongside to encourage and to be helpful. It's an encouragement that's right there. It's close. It's almost touchable. It's almost tangible. And that's what happens to us sometimes where we almost, we almost feel the presence of God physically. And you've been there sometimes. We're supposed to be that for others. But if you've ever experienced that, then you don't have a choice. If you've ever had any participation in the Spirit, if you've ever been someplace that the Spirit was moving, I know it makes us nervous as Baptists, but we, there is a third part of the Trinity. He is alive, okay? We've got to be careful of that sometimes, but he's there. He's part of us. He's part of God. He is God. He's not an it. He's not a thing. He's not the force. He's a person, Okay? But if you've ever had any participation in the Spirit where the Spirit was just there, and, you, and I can't even describe that, but he's just there. If any affection, any sympathy, then our calling is to complete the joy of Paul and by our understanding of Paul's influence and his inspiration of his writing, therefore also completing the joy of God, it's going to be when we come, become of the same mind. Several years ago, T.W. Hunt had this impressive book that, that was not quite make the press of uh, experiencing God, but was very close to that. T.W., I think, passed away in the last two or three years, I think, if I'm right. 
But he wrote this book called The Mind of Christ. And if we could ever all come to the mind of Christ, I think a lot of our challenges and difficulties would go away. Because my problem is I don't carry the mind of Christ. I carry the mind of Neil far too often. And so when I walk into a room, I walk into a church, I'm bringing the mind of Neil. And then your church members are bringing their minds. Sometimes, sometimes they're not bringing their minds, but oftentimes they are bringing their minds and they bring their mind. And my mind gets into conflict with their mind because neither of us have the mind of Christ. But what if we did? What if we looked at the scriptures and what does God want to do? It, it's it's so it's so challenging sometimes. This church thing. Because we have some people who are concerned about the facility of our building. And they're afraid about the kids running around and knocking something over. Or they're worried about somebody bringing coffee into the sanctuary because they're going to spill it. And they're going to have dirt on the carpet. And I'm all, I'm all, I'm, I'm four, I'm four, I'm four. But we forget that our business is about people. I don't want to spend too much time on my horror stories. But I've been in church business meetings where I've literally had to stand up and say, listen, um, after a 20-minute discussion, hey, our business is not killing termites. Our business is something different. Now, Terminex, that's their job, to kill termites. The Orkin man job. So let's call one of those guys when it comes to termites, because it doesn't take 60 of us to decide which kind of termite company we're going to go with in our business meeting. It's not our business. Orkin man, his business. If you can't kill the termites, we'll fire him and hire the Terminex guy. If he doesn't work, we'll hire somebody else. It's not our business. So every time we baptize somebody, and I, can, I got staff members here that can attest, my wife and then Joey and Jeannie, they can attest, that when we baptize somebody, I say, welcome to our business meeting. Because the business of the church is to love people to Christ and live the journey together. That's our business. All these other things are a piece of it. What if we had that same mind, that our business is not trying to protect the carpet, not trying to kill the termites that are around, and there'll be termites. Do you have termites in Montana? No, okay. Do you know what termites are? Yeah, they go south, I guess, is where they go. Do you have anything that eats wood here? No, you don't have any wood. Anyway, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Beavers. beavers. Who kills beavers in Montana? Fred probably does, kills beavers. So if you have beavers in your church, don't have a business meeting, call Fred. He'll come kill them for you. But you know all these things that attack. And we defend, and it's the wrong thing. It's a distraction that our enemy puts in front of us because we don't have the, his, the mind of Christ. We have each other's mind, and we miss what we're supposed to be doing. If we had the same mind, if we had the same love, we're a multi-generational congregation. It is so stinking difficult to be multi-generational. We have two different worship styles. What's happened is we have three worship services. We have three churches. I've just figured out a way to have them all pay me. It works out really well because the first service, it is a traditional service in more in large extent. And the middle service, it's this whole nother group of people who are young and they're semi cool and we do the other things. And this third service, the people who just woke up late and they don't know who they are and they just show up. And it's just so confusing thing because each one of those audience has a different need and different expectation. And what we want to do is lead them all to Christ. And so if that takes bluegrass music, let's do bluegrass music. If it's hip-hop music, let's do hip-hop music because music's important. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is what is important. So we don't unite around worship style. We reunite around the cause and of service to the community. And we'll wave that banner and we'll try to figure out how to get along with each other. And it's challenging. The first service... Because our building's not designed to turn over three times, our heating and air system can't keep up. And so in that first service in the summertime, it's about 25 degrees, which I know for you is shorts weather. I understand that. <laughs> but for us in Branson, that's cold. And my senior adults, who are already normally cold, have to put on all kinds of blankets. And they sit there and they complain and sometimes. And I just have to remind them, hey, listen, thank you for making the sacrifice. Because when we get to our third service, it's about 95 degrees in here because we can't turn around the room quickly enough. And we're hot and sweaty in that service. So if you can't, you've got to make a decision. What's more important, the climate or the music? Make a choice. <laughs> and they choose the music. And so still, they still come with their parkas on and all those things. But we love each other through that. And if we don't call those things out and, and, and just say, hey, this is the way it is, then we miss each other. We have to love each other through these things. If we had that same love for one another and for the gospel, not in competition, not those young people, not those old people. We had a, when I first came, typically a pastor will attract people 10 years older and younger than them when they first show up, typically. Typically. It may not always happen, but typically that's what happens. And we started having, back 10 years ago, young people. Now we have middle-aged people coming to our church for some reason. I don't know why that is. But we have started having young people coming. 
And we were doing the service project. And one of our sweetest ladies in the world comes to me and she says, who are those people over there? I don't know them. Who are they? And I'm like, I don't know. Maybe you should go ask them. I think I'll go do that. And so she went over there and asked them because at first she was thinking, who are those strange people in my church? But then she went and met them and then realized they are the church. It's hard what we do, guys. It is so hard what we do. But if we are motivated by the same love, we can motivate our people by the same love, something amazing can happen. Having the same love, being in full accord. This word is really the word that we get for united. It's the united word there. And this full accord has this strange connotation. It is an emotional thought. It's a thinking feeling. It's not either one of these. It's both of them. Some of you are thinkers. I'm a thinker. Some of you are feelers. You're not even listening at this point. You're like, oh, I'm cold, I'm warm. So you're not even thinking. This is not either one of those things. We tend to put those in boxes. This is not what it's talking about. It's that we have an emotional thought, a thought that's so tied in with the emotion. So it's not that I'm just thinking that, that I'm united with this person. It's that I feel as I'm thinking that I'm united with this person. It's a bizarre, weird, kind of strange feeling. But at the same time, it's not just a feeling, it's a thought. And so I'm feeling this thing as I'm thinking about I'm feeling. And for most of us, this is a challenge to do that. But that's what it means to be united. It's an intellectual process, yes, but it's an emotional response as well. It's both and. And it's united by our love of Jesus, our passion to reach other people, to see them grow and disciple, to see the kingdom advance, and to love each other and to love doing it all at the same time, which is a difficult, difficult challenge because sometimes we love the mission and sometimes we love the people. Sometimes we see the people as a way to accomplish the mission. But in fact, the people are our mission. And if we can ever put that together and have this emotional feeling, then we can be of that same mind, having one mind, and being united. So my hope is that as you leave today, you feel just a little more sense of that. Not that you have loyalty to the Montana Southern Baptist Convention. Not that you have loyalty to Fred. Those things are not bad, and I would encourage those things. But more than that, that you would have a unity and a feeling of a connection, of a thought, of this mission that we have organized around as a network of churches trying to accomplish the same thing for the same purposes together in this vast state because we need each other. And it goes awry so quickly. Has anybody notice anything wrong in the room today? Yeah. See, it's so easy to move from being united to being untied. If you hadn't noticed it, over here there's a sign. Earlier in the week it said united. Now it doesn't say united, it says untied. Fred came in and said, hey, you know, that, you know somebody messed that sign up, right? It's like, good job, Fred, way to pay attention to that. That's awesome. <laughs> your, your executive director's all over it, right? You've got to love that. You know your people. All right. <laughs> yeah. In fact, in fact, I had a handout. I was going to hand you one of these things. How many words can you make out of united? Uh, one of my assistants found like 42 words you can make out of the letters united, not multiplying the words, just using them. And we as Baptists have figured out lots of other things to do with those letters that God's called us to have being united. We've created all kinds of things. And we've done good work but our mission is to be united because that's what pleases God. So what I want to do as we leave, I just want to pray for you. And there may be some final announcements or some details that you've got to work out. But I hope in some small way that this time together has caused you to be united in all the things that you have to juggle, primarily and most importantly with spouse and with self and with God. And maybe you made some new friends. Maybe you're going to make it a point to call each other every once in a while and just check in. How are you doing? What can we do for you? How do we serve? Let's get together on a basis, on a regular basis. Let's Skype. Let's do all those kind of things to stay united. Because the mission that you're working on here is the mission I'm working on in, in Missouri. And Missouri is not any more important than Montana. Montana is not any important than anybody in Missouri. 
We've been assigned different pieces of the mosaic to give our lives to. And one day, what I look forward to in heaven that I'm aware of at this point more than anything is that we'll get to spend all of eternity hearing about that little piece of the mosaic, about how God used that and brought it all together to make this marvelous thing to make himself great and to reveal his glory. I've got to hear a little bit of the mosaic pieces, and sometimes the mosaic pieces have to be a little dark to fit what he's doing. Maybe black for a season there and darkness is there, but that's going to that's gonna be a part of what he's doing over there that one day is going to be amazing. And maybe yours is just all bright and wonderful and there's bunnies and unicorns and it's all happy and that's great. Man, that's awesome. Had nothing to do with you. It had all to do with what God decided to do in your life. Maybe it's going to be in the middle and there's going to be ups and downs like we've talked about, but he's working on this beautiful thing and he's handed you a piece of it. And who cares how many people it is? One person, each person represents the image of God and is valuable in the kingdom. And so if we spend our lives reaching one person, it is well worth it. And if you get more than one, bonus. But I look forward to the day that we gather together working for the kingdom and we get to sit down and we can say, tell me about that piece. And you'll be able to say, oh, let me tell you how that little piece, the mosaic, let me tell you what I gave my life to. Let me tell you how that worked out. And then we'll be able to go, wow, that's amazing. Because without that piece, there'd be something missing in this glorious picture that he's making that glorifies him and benefits us. So I hope that we'll take at least some time in our lives to every once in a while hear at least a couple of those stories, one with another, what he's done for us and how we're a piece of something so much larger. So wouldn't it be cool, wouldn't it be cool if we changed our logo? Uh, I forgot that. I did have it in there twice. Never mind. This was a logo that we adopted at church for a little while. We had, this is a soccer logo. Didn't go over very well in our church. Nobody liked that. And somebody said, well, I don't think we ought to change our name to United First Baptist Church Branson. I was like, no, no, no. It's just an idea. But what if your logo looked a little more like that? Not suggesting it. Not suggesting it. So don't change it or anything. But what if that's what you thought when you saw that? That we're united in this. For the glory of God and for the benefit of the people who have to live around us. Let me pray for you. Father, how good it is to have been together for these three days. To laugh together. To be honest with each other and say, man, this, this is tough sometimes. And sometimes it just flat out stinks. But Father, through it all, because we have the same mind and the same love, we're united in this. And you didn't leave us alone as we juggle. You gave us a spouse to help us juggle. You gave us lots of important things to juggle, our own families or the people that are hurting around us. Even ourselves, we have to juggle sometimes and the own afflictions of our own body, the afflictions of our own soul. But Father, you've called us to do all that together. And when we do that together, when we're united, things go better for us. And your glory is expanded in this place. And so I thank you for the privilege that we have had to gather around one another for these days and to be united. Help us to continue to have that same spirit. Help us to take our unity from a lowercase u to a capital U so that the world may know that what we speak on Sunday really is true the other six days of week as well because we fearfully and dangerously work this out every day in our own lives and in ways that others can see us. Father, we thank you for the creativity that you've given us, the gifts that you've given us that may not be like somebody else's, and we thank you for the diversity of the kingdom. We thank you for the diversity of our churches and the people. Father, help us to go back and lead them well, not for us, but for you. May we see a unity break out among Baptists, among Christians, and may it start right here in Billings, Montana, for your glory and for the benefit of our nation. And we ask these things, careful to give the praise to the name and to the person, the one who was and is and is to come, the name of Jesus. May the Lord bless you. Amen. Fred.